Welcome to the Archaeology Studio. Today's episode considers radiocarbon in archaeology. By the end of this episode, you will be prepared to evaluate the results and interpretations of radiocarbon dating in archaeological studies. You should be aware of how radiocarbon works and how it can be integrated into investigations of site stratigraphy, chronology, and larger research questions. This presentation concentrates on radiocarbon, but much of this information could be relevant for general issues of chronology and chronometric dating. In order to understand how radiocarbon dating works, first you can think about what happens to the carbon in our atmosphere. One particular isotope of carbon, called carbon-14, is radioactive. Its radioactivity occurs due to cosmic rays interacting with nitrogen in the atmosphere at a roughly stable rate through time with minor fluctuations. Carbon becomes a part of all living organisms of plants and animals. Throughout their lives, organisms continue to absorb carbon, including the C14 isotope. After an organism dies, the C14 isotope begins to decay, while other isotopes such as C12 and C13 remain stable. The C14 isotope decays at a steady rate, calculated with a half-life of 5,730 years. If you can measure the amount of C14 as compared to the amount of C12 and C13 in a sample specimen, then you can use this ratio measurement to point to the number of years since the C14 isotope had started to decay. This ratio measurement is the essence of radiocarbon dating. The results indicate when a carbon-based organism had died and stopped absorbing new carbon. Radiocarbon results could be affected by the original source of carbon in an organism. For example, long-lived specimens such as the old growth parts of old trees could contain an inbuilt older age of carbon, known as the old wood effect. By comparison, Shorter-lived specimens, such as nutshells or leaf litter, could avoid the potential for inbuilt old carbon. Another critical point is to identify the source of the carbon as coming from the land or from the ocean. In the world's oceans, carbon generally is a few hundred years older than on land, and this difference requires separate radiocarbon calibrations for marine versus terrestrial sample materials. By matching the two different sample materials, such as a piece of burned wood matched with a piece of marine shell from the same context, the two results together allow refinement of the terrestrial versus marine calibrations. Additional minor calibration differences have been noticed for specific taxa or organisms as well as between the northern and southern hemispheres. In any case, you need to know what material is being used for a radiocarbon date. As long as you know the material, then you can make the adjustments and calibrations suitable for the source of carbon in the sample. Currently, radiocarbon dating is reliable for organic materials up to 50,000 years old. The procedure itself is reliable, but the results require careful interpretation. The measured amount of C14 alone is not enough to provide a radiocarbon date. The amount of decay of C14 can be known only by comparing the amounts of C12 and C13 isotopes that have been stable. This ratio reflects the number of years since the last time when an organism had absorbed C14 while still living. 
The measured radiocarbon age typically is plotted in years before present, wherein present is fixed at the year 1950. The number of radiocarbon years can be measured by the half-life of the C14 isotope, but it fluctuated somewhat in the atmosphere over the last 50,000 years. Due to these fluctuations, a calibration curve actually varies slightly apart from a direct, steady line on a plotted chart. Moreover, a margin of error needs to be accommodated in the measurement. Current laboratory standards can be precise within some decades. When interpreting a radiocarbon result, you can draw a line at the point of the radiocarbon years to see where it intersects or intercepts with the actual calibration curve. The line in this case includes the margin of error of the radiocarbon measurement, and the calibration curve includes its margin of error as well. With this intercept procedure, you can translate the radiocarbon years into actual calendar years. Those calendar years could be in values of years before present or in traditional years of BC or AD. If you examine the calibration curve in closer detail, then you can see more of its internal variations. Some parts of the calibration curve entail vertical jumps or offsets, while other parts extend horizontally as plateau-like lines. When you include the margin of error of the radiocarbon measurement, then you can see where this measurement meets with the calibration curve, including its internal variations that directly affect the translation into calendar years. In this way, the calibrated result can span several decades or sometimes centuries. As shown in this example, a radiocarbon age of 1800 plus or minus 40 years could be calibrated more broadly than the face value of plus or minus 40 years. You can see that the largest portions of probability fall within the plateau-like segments of the calibration curve. In this particular case, two different segments include the highest peaks of probability. The probability can be viewed as a degree of confidence, and in statistics this confidence can be expressed as a standard deviation. One standard deviation equals 68.2% confidence within the probability plot. Two standard deviations would equal 95.4% confidence, and accordingly, most archaeologists today prefer to work with two standard deviations. The calibrated results can be quite different depending on the original margin of error, the point of intercept along the calibration curve, and the number of standard deviations in the interpreted output. Along with the technical issues of radiocarbon dating, archaeologists need to be aware of the context of the materials that are being dated. For each particular case, you can consider how the sample materials are situated within their original stratigraphic layers, their site associations, and other aspects of their contexts. In any excavation, the first clues about chronology are seen in the order of stratigraphic layers. Within this sequence, you can examine how the artifacts and other materials change through time. Next, specific points within this sequence can be targeted for selecting materials such as charcoal or shells for direct dating. While radiocarbon dating could be applied for any piece of organic material, the ideal candidates would be obtained from secure contexts of fixed features such as hearths or fireplaces, where the pieces of charcoal, bones, or shells are clearly within their original stratigraphic associations. In the Tumon area of Guam, I uncovered an ancient beach surface where people had used several hearth features. These features represented secure contexts for radiocarbon dating of preserved wood charcoal, 
Moreover, they contained direct evidence of the food debris and artifacts belonging definitely to the same time frame of when people had used these hearth features. In this case, the hearth context consistently revealed a coherent assemblage, most clearly seen in the fragments of a distinctive form of shallow, flat-bottomed earthenware pottery. Some of the undersides of these vessels had retained the impressions of plated mats. The radiocarbon dating from the hearths pointed to a narrow time range, most probably within the first centuries AD. When plotting the calibrated results, the highest probabilities crossed confirmed with each other, most strongly around AD 100 through 200. Next, the dating from a lower stratigraphic layer provided a corroborating older date, and a similar post-dating bracket was obtained from the overlying stratigraphic layer. In this particular case, the graphic documentation of the dating context and calibrations could be convincing, but of course, more of the data needed to be conveyed. Typically for reporting radiocarbon results, you will see a summary data table. You should be able to identify the context or provenience of each dated sample, along with a unique identifier of a laboratory reference number. The sample material itself should be identified as charcoal, shell, or other substance and with noting any other information that helps to know about what was being dated. Other relevant records include the measured radiocarbon age, the isotope correction values, and the corrected age according to the isotope ratio. You always should be able to identify the calibration curve that was used, plus any additional corrections, such as a marine reservoir correction for certain specimens. Finally, you should be able to see very clearly about the calibrated results. In another example at the site of Unai Baput in Saipan, an excavation exposed several layers with secure hearths and other features. In one of the lower layers, a hearth remnant contained red-slipped pottery, along with both wood charcoal and marine shells. This context was ideal for testing the reliability of shells for radiocarbon dating, in this case looking specifically at Anadara clam shells that appeared abundantly in the earliest archaeological layers of the region. The results here showed that the standard marine calibration curve for the shell sample was indeed accurate and matched well with the terrestrial calibration curve for the wood charcoal sample. A minor marine reservoir correction was calculated specifically for the Anadara shell in this context, and it accorded with the calculation for other Anadara shells paired with charcoal samples at sites in nearby islands of Tinian and Guam. As the excavation proceeded, another lower layer revealed more hearth features, but here the fragments of charcoal proved to be insufficient for radiocarbon dating. Instead, the Anadara shells offered the best material for dating, using the same calculation as proven for the overlying stratigraphic layer. Indeed, the dating results were slightly older in this lower layer. Again digging deeper, yet another cultural layer was uncovered, where more hearths and other features offered secure context for radiocarbon dating. Anadara shell here showed an even older dating, slightly prior to 1500 BC. When reconstructing the ancient site setting, the deepest and oldest stratigraphic layers could be understood as relating to an ancient seashore context. At that ancient time, people had lived directly at the old shoreline, where wood charcoal was poorly preserved. Through time, with change in sea level and increasing slope erosion, more stable ground developed at the site, where wood charcoal eventually became better preserved inside these later stratigraphic layers. Concurrent with the chronology of the changing sea level and coastline, the preserved shellfish records followed those transforming conditions in the stratigraphic layers. 
The pottery forms and other artifacts also change through the same stratigraphic sequence, now understood as extending slightly older than 1500 BC and continuing through nearly AD 1700. These discoveries in the Mariana Islands have been significant for confirming the first known successful human settlement in the remote islands of the Pacific. People had lived in the larger land masses of Asia and as far as Australia and New Guinea perhaps 50,000 years ago, but people did not settle in the remote oceanic region until many thousands of years later. The secure dating now in the Mariana Islands allows a confident framework for factual studies of Pacific Islands archaeology at a large scale and with region-wide implications. As you have seen here, radiocarbon dating involves a number of technical and interpretive issues. Along with understanding how radiocarbon dating works, archaeologists need to consider what material is being dated and how to situate that material within an archaeological context. In concluding this episode, now you should be familiar with radiocarbon in archaeology. You can evaluate the reliability and confidence in dating results, and you can consider how those results relate with larger research questions. I hope that you enjoyed this episode and that you will explore more with the Archaeology Studio.